Uh, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me at the back okay? Not too fast asleep after last night's party. That is good. Uh, yes, yeah, so thank you for having me here in Vilnius, and thank you for having me at Login. Uh, and a special thank you to my, uh, my Vilnius mother, Monica, who has been looking after me and making sure that uh, I have a great time here. Uh, building a better human, yes. Uh, as uh, my excellent introduction said, I am Frank Swain. You can find me on Twitter at ScienceBunk occasionally when I do go on there. And yes, the man who can hear Wi-Fi, a.k.a. a cyborg. And what do you think of when somebody says a cyborg? I know most of the people here at Login will think of Neil Harbison, who was here last year with the antenna on his head, who could hear color, uh, which is very awesome. But for, for other people who don't go to Login conferences, when you say something like cyborg, they might picture the $6 million man, uh, if you're of a certain age. Uh, you might think of Robocop, you know, the man who was uh, Murphy, who was destroyed and made again as a robot. Or you might think of video game characters, someone like uh, Metal Gear Solid, Solid Snake with a very nice robot arm there. Uh, so that's the fiction. These are people who were very heavily damaged in some way. I think Six Million Dollar Man Steve Austin uh, fell out of a helicopter or something like that, and they rebuilt him stronger, faster, better than before. And the same with Robocop. You know, he was Clarence Thomas, shot him to pieces, and they made him into a robot. And uh, Solid Snake here, same story again. It's a very dangerous uh, path to becoming a cyborg. First, you have to be, you know, really beaten up badly, and then you can be turned into a cyborg. Uh, the reality is probably a lot different. Uh, this is a uh, glucose injector, for, sorry, uh, insulin injector uh, for someone with diabetes, which monitors uh, the levels of uh, insulin going in and does it automatically. Uh, this is a pacemaker, uh, which obviously you will know what a pacemaker does. Um, and you have things like prosthetic arms. This is a man called James Young. Uh, he's got a pretty cool arm. Uh, you can see there on the side, it's got a drone that flies off and he has like lights on the side and does all kind of gizmos on there. And this was inspired by, um, by Metal Gear Solid, Solid Snake, and was created by Sophie, uh, Sophie Barata, who's a fantastic uh, prosthetist uh, who makes these very ornate, fantastic arms. Um, yeah, we'll get back to the, the, the reality and what that gives back to you in a moment. But I'll tell you about my story. Uh, this is a picture of me when I was much younger and, and more beautiful. And this is me at about 25. So this is when I first found out that I was losing my hearing. Um, nobody knows why I'm losing my hearing. It's most likely partially genetic. Um, my father lost a lot of his hearing, so did both of his brothers. Uh, but it was also because I worked in a club, so I went to a lot of loud music, you know, rock concerts, DJs, nights like that, spent a lot of time there, which was not good for my ears, and I didn't wear hearing protection, so let that be a lesson to everyone, wear hearing protection at all times. Uh, but the thing is, I didn't know I was losing my hearing, and people who go deaf, they often are the last people to know that they're going deaf. Uh, it's the people around them who notice. So as you lose your hearing, your brain works harder and harder to compensate. And so everything still sounds the same, at least to you, uh, but you're losing a lot of information along the way. And so my kind of hearing loss is in the four kilohertz region, which is where noise damage usually is felt first. And the four kilohertz region is where speech is. There's so speech is in there. And that, what that means is everything still still sounds loud, it doesn't sound like it's gone quiet or anything, but you lose the clarity of speech. So uh, if you've ever seen Peanuts, the cartoon, and all the adults in that, you ever, you ever saw them from the, sort of the, the knees up, the so knees down, and they would talk like And that's kind of what it sounds like when, when, you're, when you're going deaf. But you don't realize it because your brain becomes fantastically good at decoding that kind of nonsense. And you, I learned to lip read without even realizing that I'd learned to lip read. Uh, I would just do it, and then if people had their back to me, I wouldn't really understand what they were saying, and I'd have to guess. So, there I am. I think my hearing is just fine until I move in with my girlfriend, and I start to notice that I need the TV a little bit louder uh, than she does, and uh, she says, oh, that car alarm outside is really annoying me, and I say, there's no car alarm. What are you talking about? You're winding me up. Uh, and then I go and open the window, and sure enough, there's a car alarm going on outside. So. She noticed first, and then I went to get a hearing test, and they said, wow, boy, 
I said, uh, they put you in this little room and you wear some headphones. Has anyone here done a hearing test to put your hand up if you have a few people? Not very many. You should because it's, you know, it's good. And they put you in a little room and they put some headphones on. They give you a, bleep, uh, a button and they say, when you hear the beeps, press the, press the button. And so the beeps are really quiet and the idea is that maybe you'll miss some of them. So I stood there and they said, press the button when you hear the beeps. I said, okay. I said, you've got to press the button when you hear the beeps. And I said, yeah, okay. I said, okay, test is over. Out you come. And they said, we don't normally see this level of hearing loss in people under 40. Um, so you should really consider getting some hearing aids. And I did what everyone does when they are told that they need hearing aids, which is to say, no, I don't. That's for old people. I don't want a pair. And on average, it takes about seven years from someone going from needing hearing aids to actually getting them, because there's such a big stigma. People don't like the idea. It's for some glasses, cool, you know, Prada make glasses, Dolce Gabbana make glasses, but Dolce and Gabbana do not make hearing aids. They're horrible, they're beige, they're for old people, you don't want to get them. So it took me another five years or so before I finally relented and I decided to get some hearing aids. And that is a very, very strange experience because all of you here who have put on glasses for the first time when you found out you needed glasses and you put them on and all of a sudden you're like, wow, you know, the, the world is so amazing. They're, the trees have leaves on them. They're not just blobs of green. Uh, I can see grass. That's great. Uh, it's not the same with hearing aids at all. You put them on uh, and you do all of these tests. Again, you go back to the little room and they put things in your ears. And eventually they put them on and they turn these things on. And the audiologist says, how does that sound? And I said, oh, that sounds terrible. That sounds awful. And he said, good, that means they're working. Uh, and it's the truth. Your brain has got so adjusted to hearing the world in this very sort of soft, you know, velvety way that when you actually put all the sounds back in, uh, it sounds terrible. It sounds very, very tinny. And again, this is a reason that a lot of people struggle with hearing aids is because they don't like wearing them. It takes the brain about six weeks to adjust to hearing the world in this new way before you start hearing it normally. Uh, so uh, you put them on, everything sounds terrible. And uh, if you know what a Foley artist is, it's the person in, in movie making who sort of adds in all the sound effects uh, for a movie. I know, you're shock horror. The, the sounds you hear in movies are not there when they film it. They add them in later. Uh, and it sounded like the Foley artist in my head had just gone bananas and was mixing in all of the wrong sounds. So when I walked along, it sounded like my shoes were made of glass and it was like tink, 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 tink. And uh, yeah, I, people, I could hear them much further away than normal. So I would think I was going to turn into them. I'm like, oh, but they were very far away from me. So all very, very strange and you have to persevere. And eventually it begins to sound normal and you start to lead a normal life. Um, apart from something really interesting, and that is hearing aids don't just amplify everything. It's not like having a, an ear trumpet, you know, that would be very, very uncomfortable. I've only lost some of the hearing in some specific frequencies, and so the hearing aids try to, re to give more of those frequencies, but also they try to filter out any kind of noise. Um, so the brain does this normally, sort of subconsciously. The hearing aids have to try and match that, and it's very, very difficult. Each of these, this is the Starkey Halo device. Uh, these have a quad-core processor in each one, so each year, like eight processors, um, to try to process all of this sound and decide what is noise and what is useful sound. And so, for example, traffic noise uh, might be dampened down and vocal speech might be lifted up. So if I walk outside now wearing these, it's a very strange experience because I walk into a busy street, there's a lot of traffic, you've got all of that kind of white noise, the tires on tarmac and the engines, and then five seconds later, it just all disappears. It's very nice, um, but it's not real. It's not a realistic interpretation of the world. And like I said, you have to, it's like you're painting a picture and your brain has to get used to hearing the world in this particular way. So these hearing aids, they're very, very good, but they don't always get it right. And one of the really key things they don't tend to get right is music. It's very hard for robots don't understand music. Uh, machines generally don't understand music. It's a human thing. So when music comes on, if I'm listening to some you know, rock music in my car, then the hearing aids decide, oh, all of that trashy symbols, that's, that's just noise. Let's just take that away too. And so all of the music starts to sound really terrible. 
Um, and, you know, these are just things you have to kind of deal with and overcome, and hearing aids get better every year, they get better at dealing with it. So really, you're spending the rest of your life listening to an impression. It's an impression of the world. It's not a direct reality. Uh, someone somewhere has made a decision and written some code that decides whether something is noise or whether something is useful, and that's what it allows me to hear. So I'm really listening to someone else's interpretation of the world, and I thought, Oh, this is interesting, so I'm going to have to spend the rest of my life listening to an interpretation of the world, so why don't I get to have a say in that? These little devices are making these decisions for me. Even when I don't want them to, they, you know, they mess around with my rock music and make it sound terrible. Um, so I want to play a role in that. And around the same time I got here, my first set of hearing aids, some very, very interesting technology came onto the market, and that is this. this is the Starkey Halos uh, made for iPhone technology, and Apple developed a codec which allows you to stream audio over the low energy Bluetooth connection, which is the same connection that Fitbits use, um, and most sort of like wearables and things like that. Extremely low power, incredibly low power. And so uh, the idea is that uh, not only can you interact with your hearing aids through your phone, which is very useful because, as you can see, there's not a lot of room for buttons on, on a hearing aid. These, you know, technically, these are very big hearing aids, according to the industry. These are huge. Um, so they tend to be very, very small devices. You, even if you wanted to give people more control to allow them to change the volume or to change it from one setting to another, there's not really a lot of space for buttons on them. More or less, you can get one, maybe two buttons at all. So the TrueLink comes out, and this allows you to connect a, a hearing aid with a smartphone. And suddenly, you have all of these options. You can turn the volume up, you can turn the volume down, you can change you know, more high-end, more low-end, change different programs depending on where you are. You can even set programs to be geolocated. So if you know these particular settings work best when you're in the office, you walk into the office, your phone detects that you're there, and it changes the settings on your hearing aids automatically. So very, very cool. But the really cool thing was the audio streaming. So with these devices, uh, any audio on the phone can be streamed directly to my ears. So phone calls, music, and that kind of thing. And this really got me thinking about what other data could you gather on a phone and turn it into sound? Because right now, with the iPhone connected to my ears, any data, absolutely any data that you can produce on that phone as a portal to the entire world, you know, through an internet connection, uh, can be turned into sound and can be turned, you know, pushed into my ears. So this is a really uh, exciting development. So I started to think about this. What do I want to hear? Um, and this is where it becomes important for you, because all of you here are going to be developing better humans. You are my, uh, my, my, my partners in crime, as it were, and I'm relying upon all of you here to join me on this project of building a better human. So there's some things you have to know about it first. Uh, to add something to my ears, I could have said, OK, I want to hear a ding every time I get an email, but uh, that's kind of boring. Um, the advantage of hearing is really that it's continuous. It's always there, it's always turned on. And so I wanted a data set that was not only continuous, but would also change from place to place depending on where I was, and would also only really be understandable when you listen to it for a long time. I didn't want to gather some kind of data that you could just have clicked and read on your phone. So. We bandied around a lot of different ideas, space weather, radiation, uh, pollution, but I really didn't want to have to carry a, an additional device. I don't want to have to walk everywhere with a Geiger counter because anyone here could walk around with a Geiger counter uh, listening to radiation with a pair of headphones. It's not really the same. So I worked with uh, a guy called Daniel Jones, who's a sound artist, and the one we came, the thing, idea we settled on was Wi-Fi, so I should explain this picture here. Um, some of you may recognize it. This is called Light Painting with Wi-Fi by Timo Arno, um, an artist and technician, and what they did was cr just put LEDs on a big stick, and these LEDs would light up when there's a Wi-Fi signal, and then they did these long exposure walks through the city, and so what you can actually see here is the strength of Wi-Fi uh, mapped directly onto a location. So it's a very cool project, very cool idea, and Phantom Terrain is the, the thing that I developed to hear Wi-Fi is sort of very much in this space as well. 
so I joined up with Daniel Jones, fantastic sound artist, and we developed Phantom Terrains. Uh, and this was supported by Starkey, the people who make the hearing aids that can connect to an iPhone, and through Nesta, which is the National Endowment for Science, Technology, and the Arts in the UK, who funded us. So two very important partners there. Um, I'm deciding whether to show you first, or let's show you first, and then you can listen to it. So uh, this is the kind of data that we pull up. By the way, these graphics are developed by Stephanie Posovec, who's a data artist who worked with Google and a few others. I would very much recommend her. She's absolutely fantastic. And this is the data that the iPhone draws. And the system works by hacking an iPhone, breaking it open, allowing us to extract all of the information about Wi-Fi fields in the area. And every single router that you might have, anyone that's anywhere, it sends out data 50 times a second. It's just sending out these little hello signals. And it says, hello, I'm a router. My name is this. My security settings are this. My manufacturer is this. My channels, my everything. So all of this information is being spewed out all of the time by routers. They're giving away a lot. And what Phantom Terrains does is to grab all of that information, run it through some fancy coding that Daniel made, which will turn it into a sound, and then to stream that sound to my ears so that I get this sort of interpretive version of the world. And what you can see here is me walking through the street and all of the different, uh, every dot on there is a Wi-Fi router. And the lines you know, on the path are the strength of the signal and the kinds of different signals that we're seeing. And there's some interesting things. When you walk down a narrow street, you tend to get much fewer, uh, fewer signals. And then sometimes you get to an open area and you can really see you know, routers from very far away. Uh, and incidentally, we know the location of all of these routers because there's a sort of secret Apple API where Apple have mapped the location of every single router in the entire world. And so we were calling that up. And uh, that allows us to hear this in stereo to know which direction uh, a router is, is landing. And I think they may have closed that door now. So I may have lost my stereo hearing. So let's have a little sound about uh, listen to the Wi-Fi in this room. Uh, if I can get this up and running, let's have a look. Slide. Do do do. And here we go. So yeah, there we are. That's, that's hearing Wi-Fi. That's the Wi-Fi live. That's not pre-recorded in this room right now. Sounds strange, doesn't it? Um, of course, we can make it sound like anything we want to. As I told you, this is uh, interpretive. The, you know, Wi-Fi signals don't have a, a sound, a real sound. And what you heard there was that crackling, that sort of fizzing noise, was a raw count of the number of routers in the area. So this is a very, you know, uh, heavily. Uh, serviced area, so you can hear a lot of buzzing, a lot of crackling. Uh, the density of those fields is very strong. And the, um, the melody that you can hear. Phantom Terrains takes the, the most prominent signal and turns the name and a few other parameters into a melody. And so it's a bit like a phone number. If, you, if anyone here remembers uh, when you used to go onto the internet with a dial-up modem and you'd hear that little It's a little bit like that in the sense that I'm not supposed to be able to hear that melody and say, oh, yes, you know, I, can, I understand the name of that Wi-Fi router. But at the very least, I can recognize it. So when I hear them over and over again, for example, I like get home, I hear the melody, and I'm like, oh, yeah, that's, that's my home Wi-Fi router. I feel like I'm home now. Or if I go into the tube network in London, all of the tube, every tube station has the same, uh, the same companies running their routers on it that are all the same name. So I go down there, and I'm like, oh, yeah, that's, that's the tube. I know where I am. So a bit of a sense of familiarity uh, to it. Now. What's the point of hearing Wi-Fi? I think that's <clears throat> a question that a lot of people ask me. Why, why would you want to hear Wi-Fi? Um, even if I coded it specially so that I could hear open networks and say, oh, there's some free Wi-Fi over here. We could have done that. Um, but that's not really the point. The point is to 
explore two different things. Number one, to retain control of my, or to, to pull back control of my body. So to say that I don't want a technician somewhere making decisions about how my hearing works for the rest of my life. I want to, to be part of that process. And it's also about exploring this idea of when you have a, a hearing device and you're wearing it all of the time and it can connect to a smartphone, you have, the, you have a platform. So it's a, an augmented reality platform for your ears. Uh, and so what do you build within that ecosystem, within that architecture? Uh, there's huge amounts of things you could do. Uh, you could do something useful, you know, you could, um, I could make an app so that when I was cycling in London, whenever I passed somewhere there where there's a, you know, a cyclist was knocked down or killed, I could hear a little warning in my ears. And again, that's a kind of data that, yeah, you could produce a map every single day and every cyclist in London would have to look at this map and say, to memorize where all of these places were and say, okay, I'll try not to cycle there. Uh, but it's not really practical. But if you can hear it and it updates automatically and you just, you know, you're cycling along and all of a sudden you hear a little alarm saying, okay, be careful because you know, someone was hit here last week, then that changes your experience of the world and it changes, uh, it takes advantage of the, the system, this always on, always you know, uh, augmented reality uh, hearing. So it's about exploring that space. And of course, lots of people here are thinking, that's not relevant to me, but we'll get to that in a second. Uh, some notes about these other cyborgs that I picked up because if you are deciding to go in to build a better human, you have to understand the, um, the motivations and, and what people want. Uh, so I said James Young, he had a young man, had a terrible accident, got hit by a train, arm and leg taken off, uh, in the prime of his life. He doesn't want to be you know, uh, any less than any other normal guy out there having his life. And so he got this, this arm, this uh, solid snake-inspired arm developed by uh, Sophie Baratta, and it has a drone and it has these lights and it got huge amounts of press and everyone thought it was really cool. It's not a very good arm. And I, I don't say that as a, a slight against James or a slight against Sophie. Uh, but this arm was paid for by the marketing company behind Metal Gear Solid. So this is an advertising billboard. He has made himself into an advertising billboard um, wearing this arm that isn't particularly useful and isn't particularly what he wants. Uh, and he did this because he's hoping to use that press, to use that profile that he's raised, to then buy the arm that he does want. And what he does want is titanium anchor bolts that go into the bone, which makes it a lot more comfortable to have a prosthetic rather than having a suction cup uh, that attaches to your skin, which is not particularly comfortable at all. So. Although you might think that having a drone on your arm was really, really cool, uh, actually he just wants something that's actually completely different. But good luck, I hope that he gets it. Uh, this is Jojo Cranfield. This is another development by Sophie Baratta. This beautiful prosthetic arm with a snake on it. And as far as I know, uh, Jojo Cranfield is a swimming instructor. I think that she was born uh, without her arm, so she's never had an arm. And there's this wonderful quote that goes with this. I had to write it down because it was so good. So talking about her, her snake arm, uh, she says, Jojo says, I've never seen the interest in having a prosthetic arm. They are heavy, uncomfortable, and not at all practical. My alternate arm makes me feel powerful, different, and sexy. So the motivation for, for having these things is not maybe what you expect. And if you approach this, uh, approach people with disabilities saying, I'm going to fix you, I'm going to make you like a normal person, they're probably going to tell you where to go because they don't want to be fixed. What people want is to have their body do the things that they want to do to allow them to lead the life that they want to lead. The ones, you know, the, the prosthetics that I showed you before, the cyborg things, the insulin pump. An insulin pump is not there to fix the pancreas. The insulin pump allows you uh, to let your child sleep through the night without having to wake them up every two hours to test their blood sugar level. Um, a pacemaker is not there just to make the heart work correctly. It allows a grandfather to play with his grandchildren. This kind of thing. So, you know, prosthetics are really about, not about fixing something within the body, but with changing the way your relationship with the world and your relationship with other people. Going deaf is incredibly lonely. Um, you 
They say that blindness cuts you off from the world, but deafness cuts you off from other people. You would not believe how many important conversations happen when you're sort of lying in a bedroom and you've already taken your ears off, and then your partner is whispering something in the quiet of the night, and you don't understand what they're saying. You can't hear them anymore, and so you have to say, "Hang on, get up, I'll turn the lights back on, put my hearing as well." And so it puts this this barrier between you. And if I didn't have those devices at all, then you can't follow conversations with your friends in the pub. You don't know what they're laughing about. Uh, you can't have these intimate conversations with your partner. Uh, so yeah, you begin to to distance yourself from everyone else. So what hearing aids mean to me isn't fixing my hearing. It's allowing me to connect with other people again, the people I care about. So that's very important. All right. So. Why is this important to you? I think most of the people in this room don't have hearing loss.、Uh, they don't need a prosthetic right now.、Uh, why should you care? It's because I need you. I need your help. And I told you before that Starkey and, and Apple had developed this codec, this low-energy Bluetooth codec that allows you to stream、uh, from a phone to a hearing aid for a week on a battery that's the size of an aspirin. I mean, the the iPhone battery will die. Long before the battery in these hearing aids does, but they can stream audio for a week. It's amazing.、Um, and this technology, Apple, as much as I respect them for developing this, and it does allow me to lead a better life. I did speak to a representative once, and I said, "Oh, so you know, why have you why have you poured money into this? Why have you developed this codec? It was there on the iPhone 5. It's been around for a while."、Um, I said, "This codec nobody knows about, and you don't use it for anything else. You know, why did you make it?" And he said, "Oh well, we just we really care about, you know, our customers who might have disabilities and need this kind of accessibility stuff." And I said, "That's really sweet, but it's not true, is it?、Um, you, that's not why you developed it. You were trying to make some kind of wireless hearable." And sure enough, within a few years. Everyone is making wireless hearable devices. This is the Hear One.、Uh, this is a fully occluding device that promises to cut out screaming babies, and it's like Instagram for your ears. It's going to make the world sound really beautiful.、Uh, this is the Moto Hint, which is actually one of the first ones to come out. It's been out quite a while.、Uh, same thing. Fully occluding. When I say fully occluding, I mean it's like.、Um, Uh, and a soft gel earbud that stops you from hearing anything from the outside world. So it's hearing aids are not fully occluding. Almost, I think, only for people with absolutely very severe hearing loss, have hearing aids that cut out everything. What hearing aids do is they're open, and they just add sound to the normal environment. If you do have a fully occluding、uh, hearing aid, it would be very uncomfortable to do things because your own voice would sound really, really weird,、um, and If you've ever had earbuds in and you've been eating cornflakes or something crunchy, and you know how loud it is, that would happen all the time. So it wouldn't be comfortable at all. So fully occlusive、uh, hearing aids are not fantastic. I wouldn't recommend them.、Uh, this is the Apple AirPod. I'm not sure if that's fully occluding or not.、Um, this is the Sony Xperia hearing device. I don't think it's got a name yet. It's sort of very. I think it's on pre-order, but it's not quite there yet. And this was came out as a, a concept at Mobile World Congress、uh, earlier this year.、And、this, incidentally, is not fully occluding. It has a hole in it, so you can hear the environment normally. And、uh, Sony have some kind of fancy name for this. So this is the open ear concept that we've come up with that hearing aids have been using for the last 30 years. But you know, okay, Sony, you came up with that. Good for you. So hearable devices.、Uh, this is finally the braggy. Dash, which has、uh, just been relaunched with new models, lots of cool tech, and interestingly, the Braggy Dash has part. Braggy have partnered with Starkey, who make hearing aids, one of the biggest hearing aid companies in the world, to build the technology that goes on inside them. And again, I'm not entirely sure whether whether the Braggy Dash is open or closed. I think it's closed because they're waterproof. You go swimming in them.、Um, so Braggy did have a lot of.、Um, Health metrics on their first one. This was something that would measure your pulse when you were running. That would sort of like tell you to run faster or whatever. And、uh, the new ones, I don't think, have so many health options. But they do have something that's called、uh, super hearing, a super hearing setting.、Uh, so as well as playing music to your ears and allowing you to take phone calls, they will also let you hear a bit better, which sounds to me an awful lot like a hearing aid. But nobody calls them hearing aids because hearing aids are not cool and they're for old people.、Uh, so this is a super hearing function on a hearable, which is, you know, as you can see, only worn by really attractive women for the most part.、Um, you know, no one like me.
Um, so what we are seeing is this uh, new ecosystem opening up. And I should also add that uh, we also have voice assistants. So a lot of companies are building hardware, which goes into your ear, which is intended not for episodic use, but to actually sit in your ear all day. You wear this thing all day, um, and then you take it out at the end of the day. With a fully occluding one, that would not be comfortable. But for the Sony, uh, I, can, I wear these every waking minute of my life, and I don't, even, I don't even remember that I'm wearing them for the most time. Sometimes I accidentally get in the shower and uh, nearly ruin them. Um, so they're bringing out devices that you will wear all of the time, um, and it will connect to your smartphone. And your, that will allow you to do things like take calls straight to your ears, listen to music straight to your ears. But there's also millions of dollars being poured into voice-activated assistants. So you have Microsoft Cortana, you have OK Google, you have Siri, you have Amazon's Alexa. Uh, everyone is getting in on this game because tech companies understand that the future architecture for how we interact with our devices is not going to be looking at a screen. In, in, you know, within five to ten years, the idea of going around looking at your phone and almost getting run over by a car, we'll look back and say, how are we so stupid? That's a ridiculous way to go through the world. Uh, instead, what you will have is what I have already, which is a, you know, a hearing device connected to your phone. And then if you want to know how to get to you know, Vilnius train station or to get to the after party at login, all you will do is just say, hey, Siri, how do I get to the train station? Or, OK, Google, how do I you know, get to my hotel? And you'll hear the answer come into your ear. And then you wouldn't ever have to take your phone out of your pocket. You'll just follow the instructions, turn left, turn right. I use this when I'm on my bicycle. It's great. I'm riding around, and I can hear in my ears, turn left, turn right, go up, go down. It's a fantastic way to live. So tech companies are all converging on this idea that hearing the, this augmented reality audio space is the next kind of terrain to conquer. So we won't have to look at our devices anymore. Maybe in the future, mobile phones won't even need to have screens because the idea of looking at a screen is a bit stupid. Everything, all of the information you need will just be a vocal voice assistant in your ear. And this is really, really interesting because hearing and augmented reality for sound and augmented reality for vision are completely different. And honestly, I think this is why Google Glass failed. No one likes Google Glass. And I think part of the problem is that Vision is incredibly precise, and this is why we use it um, so much. You know, if you've ever had to, uh, if you get to an article and you've got a choice of sort of listening to the, the, the audio podcast version of it or listening, you know, reading it, you're going to read it because that's so much faster. Bish, 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 really quick. So vision is very, very precise and it allows us to absorb data points that are, that are very, very precise, very clear, incidental. The, the problem with vision is that it's very narrow band. You can only really look at one thing at a time, uh, which is why everyone goes around looking at their phones all of the time like this, because you can't keep your eyes everywhere at all times. Audio is different. So audio, you can listen to as many things as you want at once. If you think of an orchestra, you know, even in this picture, there's, what, at least 20 people. There's probably a 50-person orchestra, and you can listen to all of those people play. Um, you can hear the harmonies, the percussions, the changes in tempo. You could probably hear if one of the you know, players was out of time or out of key. Um, you can hear all of this data, all of this dynamic information at once, seamlessly. And you can probably also hear the people next to you like rustling, eating their you know, sweets, or you might hear someone coughing over there. All of this information at once is being monitored by your brain, and you don't even feel like you're doing work. It just, it just comes straight into you. But if anything went wrong with that, if the, you know, someone's out of tune, as I said, or you know, someone's had having a fight, or you know, whatever might happen, your attention would then be drawn to it. Um, so you are subconsciously monitoring all of this at once, and it doesn't really take much energy at all. Uh, it's an hearing is incredibly broadband. If you think you can see all of the sheet music there, if I printed all of that sheet music out and held it up, there is no way that you could consume that information that is on that sheet music at the same speed as which you can consume it 
when you hear it as an audio. So audio, incredibly broadband, but not particularly precise. Unless you've got perfect pitch, you're not going to be able to tell whether you know, a certain clarinet note is a B or a C or a, you know, a flat, B flat, anything like that. And the point of this is really that if we are moving into an ecosystem where the apps on our phone are primarily based for an audio consumption rather than a visual consumption, and you're going to play something into someone's ear, you can't just say, oh, well, I'll just get my app and I'll, I'll make it into a sound thing. You know, the information will be read out instead of looking at it. That's not going to work. What, you, what we need to do is completely rethink the kinds of data that work best in audio. And as I said before, this is, uh, all, this is data that is continuous, data that is dynamic, data that you can only really make sense of when you consume it you know, for a long period of time or over you know, a period of time so that you can really detect the changes. And, and that, again, another example would be if your phone is on silence and you're waiting for an important call, you have to sit there looking at your phone waiting for it to come on. You can't do anything else, you're just there. But if your phone has the ringer turned on and you're waiting for an important call, you can go and do other things, you can just sit there. And it doesn't feel like energy, but what you're actually monitoring is for a change in the sound. And when the phone goes from being silent to ringing, then you'll be like, I need to pick up the phone. So that's an example of when, even when you don't think you're listening to your phone, you are listening to your phone, you're listening to the fact that it's not ringing. And that's telling you, information about what to do, whether to pick it up or not pick it up. So on this provision that everyone is going to be moving into hearables, that voice activated systems are becoming a huge driving force, which will encourage people to go out and buy the Braggy Dash, or buy the AirPods, buy the you know, Moto Hint, buy the uh, uh, Sony Xperia. What do you want to build in that space? There is a whole new app store, you know, space opening up and it's going to be crying out for intelligent, tech-minded people like the good people of Vilnius and the Baltic states to develop apps that work within that sphere and to do wonderful things. I, people say, Frank, you know, what should we be building in this space? I don't know. Um, you go mad. That's really a question that's open to everyone. But think of data that is complicated, data that is that can't be simplified, that can only be truly appreciated at speed when you turn it into sound, and then you might be in the right direction. The only one I can really think of is something like the stock market. Every, every day you watch the news and they say the Dow Jones went up by six points or down by four points, and that is, to me, insane. That is taking all of this trading, billions of trades in a single day, and saying, OK, we're only going to look at 100 companies, and then we're going to condense all of this data down into it went up six points, we're in down four points. That is almost meaningless when you set it in the contrast of a billion trades in a day, or whatever it might be. But if you listen to that information as sound, you could easily, every trader could be like, you know, every stock could be a player in your orchestra. And so you could listen to your portfolio and instinctively hear that one of them wasn't performing well or that two of them weren't performing, or whatever it might be. Your, the way that you interacted with that data and consumed that data would be completely different and I think a lot richer and you would understand it better. So on that note, uh, I was told to finish with a call to action and my call to action to everyone here today at Login is that we need you you or everyone here to help build a better human. So thank you.